Good morning, everybody. I am calling the executive committee meeting to order. As a reminder, this meeting is being held as a virtual meeting with members of the committee participating remotely. In addition, the meeting is being streamed live on the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority website. Electronic devices which emit a sound should be turned off or otherwise set to vibrate or silent. If everyone could please ensure your computer microphone and sound are also muted. I would like to remind the executive committee members to please ensure your cameras are turned on so the clerk can uh, be made aware or monitor quorum. But I'm now going to ask the clerk if she could uh, conduct an attendance and roll call for each member of the committee. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Ainsley? Present. Barton? Carol? Present. Dyes? Present. Fletcher? Fonseca? Jackson? Present. Morley? Good morning, I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Pellegrini? Peruzza? Santos has sent in regrets. Sachs? Thank you. And I just saw uh, Councillor Fletcher pop in. Thank you. Thank you. Present. Perfect. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, for the acknowledgement of Indigenous territory, I would like to say on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, we respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on traditional territories and treaty lands, in particular those of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the Anishinaabe of the Williams Treaty First Nation, the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Metis Nation. As stewards of land and water resources within the Greater Toronto Region, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority appreciates and respects the history and diversity of the land and is grateful to have the opportunity to work and meet in this territory. Thank you. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting that was held on February 3rd, 2023. Moved by Amber Morley. All in favor? And that carries. Sorry, I'm, we're happy, I'm, I, I'm happy to second that, Mr. Chair. It's Peruzza. Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. Sorry, are there any okay. questions about those minutes? Seeing none, okay. Are there any disclosures uh, by any members of the board who wish to close a pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. I will read out each item on the agenda that may be approved on consent. Members of the executive committee may ask that an item be held so it can be further discussed. Please indicate your intention to hold an item verbally by giving me your name. The person that holds the item will be given the opportunity to speak, ask questions and speak first when the item is brought forward. If an item is not held, the motion is deemed to be approved as written and will be recommended for adoption at the April 28th direct Board of Directors meeting. No further discussion of the item will take place at this meeting. So our consent listing under section one item for the Board of Directors action 8.1 RFT supply and delivery of cobblestone to Ashbridge's Bay landform project. This is uh, designated beaches three and four. Anybody like to hold this item? I'll hold that, Councillor Fletcher. Fletcher. Uh, item 8.2 is 2023 unfunded priorities. And just as a note, following the meeting, the list of unfunded priorities broken down by municipality and region is gonna be uploaded with this report. Would anybody like to hold this item? Councillor Sachs? Uh, number three, update on the finance agreement for the new administrative office building project. Mr. Chair, can I can I hold that just for a minute? I may have questions on it. I'm just trying to get the materials. A little yep. problem with my own tech. No problem. Shelley Carroll is holding 8.3, 8.4 investment statement, a policy and procedure update. I also would like to say attachments three and four are confidential. They haven't distributed through the closed session package. If there's an 
uh, and need to discuss these attachments, we would have to go in camera at the end. Would anybody um, like to hold this item? Chair Inzi, I have questions of staff. Sorry, Amber Morley? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amber. Uh, under doo -doo -doo, section two, items for executive committee action. 9.1 is an application for permit pursuant to section 2.8.0.1 of the Conservation Authorities Act, MZO, Regulation 698-20. Anybody like to hold this? Seeing none, could I have a mover, please? Moved by Linda Jackson. All in favor? That carries. Under Section Point 3, Items for Information of the Board, 10.1 is the 2023 to 20. I don't see them, so maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. Sorry, 10.1 is the 2023 to 2026 information technology strategy and roadmap. There is a presentation available if uh, anybody would like one. Seeing no holds on this, uh, 10.2 2022 year end financial report. A couple of questions there, Mr. Chair. Okay, Shelly Carroll. 10.3, summary of senior staff expenses for 2022. Seeing no holds on that item. 10.4, uh, 2022, summary of procurements. Seeing no holds on 10.4, 10.5, first quarter 2023 communications, marketing, and events summary from January 1st to March 31st, 2023. Seeing no holds on that one, I need somebody to uh, move 10.1, 10.3, 10.4, and 10.5. Moved by Diane Sachs. Uh, Section 4, Ontario Regulations 166-06 is amended major permit applications, regular for approval. Uh, under this, we have 11.1, .1, City of Mississauga Dairy Road from west of Highway 410 to west of Fir Tree Drive. John, should we do a site visit? Love doing site visits with you anytime. Anytime All right. you site visit, I'm there. It's it's counselor for the Zegas world, so yeah, yeah, close to All it. right, no hold. <laughs> it's not it's not in my ward, not but I don't know ward, if you would it's... want to do a site visit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seeing seeing that, no holds on eleven point one, eleven point two, standard delegated permits for receipts, staff approved and issued. Seeing no holds on that item, could I have uh, someone move approval of 11.1 .1 and 11.2? Chris Fonseca, all in favor? That carries. Uh, and then we have two items in the closed session if we need to go on camera. 12.1 uh, is a verbal update regarding our food services agreement. And 12.2 is a verbal update regarding the Humber Gap Trail. I don't know if anybody would like to go into camera on either one of those items. Mr. I, Chair. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. 12.1. Okay. Same. Thanks. Okay. And we'll see if anybody wants to reconsider 12.2 when we get there. Sorry, Mr. Chair. There... I don't... Sorry. Don't... Fletcher. Paula Fletcher. Sure, going ahead. Was Shelly Carroll not ahead of me? No? No, sorry, I had the same hold as Linda. I'm good. Thank yeah. you. Oh, I'm just wondering about the RBC statements and investments there, given their high uh, fossil fuel use. <coughs> and through the chair. Yes? 
I did see also uh, at Council Fletcher, I, I, I did also see uh, Councillor Sachs's hand up, and I didn't know if that was also for the earlier item, and I just wanted to clarify. Councillor Sachs? Yeah, I was hoping, I, I was hoping for a brief verbal update on the gap trail. Okay. It's very short, but I, I would like to know what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm just looking at decision making around investments and uh, environmentally friendly banking and investment policy. If we have that or not, I don't know. Can I just add, I you know, point of order, check in there. Um, I had held the policy statement around investments for a similar reason, Councillor Fletcher, to ask yep. questions. Was, is that the appropriate time to do that or uh, is it later down in the agenda? Oh, no. Yeah. So we, we can ask questions in public on 8.4 and then we can also go on camera and discuss it if there's confidential questions. Okay, wonderful. And really my questions are echoing counselors and yeah. so if it's a quick discussion, I can uh, release that hold as well. I just want okay. to make sure that that's an issue that we can kind of, now that that's been revealed, how we would like to proceed in any way with Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can review that in camera and as well if we need to. Uh, Shelly, you have your hand up. Can I just say, Mr. Chair, so maybe just so that staff can prepare uh, while we're, we're doing the earlier items. I, I had similar questions and I didn't know if I needed the closed or the public. I think what it is is some of us are new to receiving the annual statement. And so we, we just want to know overall what is our, it may, you, you may have covered it in the strategic plan earlier with veteran members, but we don't know what the investment strategy is. So. If staff could pr be prepared to give us a, you know, a, a quick five minutes on it when we get to that item, uh, uh, I think that would really help because that's what I'm looking for as well. I, I'm as new to it as as Amber and Diane may be. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we can do that. As I speak for staff, John. <laughs> okay. We at this point we're going to go back to the beginning of the agenda. Uh, 8.1 RFT supply and delivery of cobblestone to Ashbridge's Bay land form project designated beaches three and four. Paula Fletcher, you held this item. Questions of staff? Uh, yes, uh, I did hold that item, and I'd just like to be clear as to the extent. Uh, uh, if these are the groins, John. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze. Bless you. <laughs> The development of the new beaches and the impact on the water quality uh, at the Ashbridge's promontory, that is something that I've been quite interested in. I don't know if you've done any assessment when you're creating these new beaches or not. So through the chair, I know a great deal of this was wrapped into uh, the environmental assessment that I, I know uh, Toronto Water uh, with uh, um, the city had led. Um, a large part of this was covered off in terms of the environmental effects on that. Uh, I'm going to ask some of the staff to to speak to that. And I know you and I have had a discussion and I know Toronto Water has been involved regarding your concerns about water quality and um, and, and, and water quality in Ashbridge's Bay. Some of that is wrapped up in the need for the elements of that, you know, previous, previous environmental assessment approval to be implemented. And I know that is a combined sewer overflow system and there's tanks and other things that are part of the, the overall undertaking associated with that. But maybe I'll ask staff, uh, Lisa, can you perhaps speak to that or Anil? Anil, Lisa, thank you. So, what's the start? I can jump in, John, through the chair. Um, so as part of the environmental assessment, we did look at water quality modeling and we undertook it in a variety of scenarios. So similar to what John was saying, we've got kind of our existing conditions right now where we do have um, combined sewer overflow in coat source cut, um, but then we've got kind of this ultimate condition where we know Toronto water has infrastructure being put in place on the treatment plant property and um, we'll be addressing those CSOs. Um, so we have looked at that through the EA and the one of the things I would say, Councillor Fletcher, that is something that we have to monitor moving forward. Interestingly enough, is some of that work that will happen with Toronto Water taking those CSOs offline is we're gonna to have to look at the water circulation in Coatsworth Cut because funny enough, those CSOs are actually pushing also things out and knowing that this work that we're doing um, right now um, with the landform and the breakwaters, um, it was always identified that we may need to look at some 
um, artificial circulation measures to just make sure that that water is turning over in the cut and such. So we'll have a long-term monitoring from that perspective, um, from the circulation perspective. Just on the circulation perspective, and perhaps we should really be looking at that site visit point of view from the Bruins. I don't think that's only tier. That's a TRCA project as well, John. It's not simply a Toronto water for uh, the groins, but all of that water that's now captured within the groins is taking the CSOs and we're creating algae blooms where they weren't existing before. So I'm quite concerned about the conditions, water conditions that have been created with this and quite interested where the environmental assessment, and I'm wondering if you can please um, have one of the staff just pull that that you've anticipated this actual situation of creating um, a, a green mat on top of water that actually was very, one point, quite clear. It counts, Fletcher, through the chair, we did look also, sorry, at that shoreline piece too. And one of the things that is to our advantage with Ash Bridges Bay and the new landform is that we are in pretty deep water where the landform is extending out and there will be a lot of turnover that happens there. So the water quality modeling report looked at the whole landform and it also looked at the basin of Coatsworth Cut and also the Yacht Club Basin. So that's something that we could share with you too. It, it, like I said, it's done under those three scenarios, existing conditions, the landform without um, Toronto Waters upgrades, and then also the ultimate condition where we would have the um, other, you know, factors looking after um, in the area too. So we could always provide you with a bit of a summary of that information too. That would be great because you've created a brand new basin actually. You've extended yes. the basin and now there is no water circulation from the big part of the lake into that So. And I'd, I'd, I'd wanted that to, to the chair. I just, it, we're in the environmental assessment to address that. Thank you. And, and through the chair, I, just because it is, you know, with, with the city and uh, with Lou and, and team from Toronto Water, I'd want to make sure that they're part of that discussion because it is an integrated project. But but the cobble specifically, and I, and I know it's uh, raised in, in con connection with that, the cobble and, and some of the materials that we are bringing, some of that is uh, part of that overall commitment to create a net ecological benefit. Uh, the cobble beaches, they do provide, and I know you're familiar with us doing this in other parts of your ward and, and, and on the waterfront, but it is it is something that we are committed to do because of uh, the DFO requirements and the permitting and everything that's associated with the implementation of this. That's our part of it um, that we help the city uh, on, on. And I think that's uh, that's part of that project, but absolutely, I think, you know, you've shared this with me. I know you've shared it with the general manager over there as well. Uh, we'll continue to uh, follow up. But I think if we could uh, take that as direction to staff, that there'll be a, a summary and a meeting, if that's okay, a, a joint meeting with well, you. Okay. With you. That you. would be that would be great. Well, Thank anybody you. who's interested in it's starting to look like the Rouge River with the, all the green <clears throat> algae blooms everywhere at, uh, on that park, which I don't think is your intention, but it is the actuality so thank you any other questions on this item seeing none sorry john and i don't know lisa if, the, if this is a john question or a lisa question i the kind of waterfront historian in me knows you know a hundred years odd years ago there was a huge marsh in that area and the city just took it out because at the time it was th thought that marsh areas like that created disease and spread germs. So the work were you doing, is it returning it back to that marshy area and that so algae is going to come naturally with it? Or could you explain it? Am I off going off on a tangent, Lisa? Yes, you're on, you're on a tangent now, uh, Councillor. Okay. Um, Lisa, you now sound a lot like Councillor Fletcher, though. <laughs> One thing I will mention, no, we're not getting back into a wetland situation or something that really does replicate 
what would have been existing there historically. But as John mentioned, we have a number of features that have been integrated into the landform and also within um, kind of behind the breakwater structure that are tar targeting uh, fish habitat. So uh, it's not a wetland, but we do have a feature in between the breakwater on the treatment plant shoreline that um, is a little bit of an emergent area that is targeting fish habitat too. So um, this area has been really devoid of fish and habitat in the past because of its the lake filling that occurred and the very unnatural shoreline. So um, it was a big goal of this work to improve um, that habitat moving forward. So we're not getting to existing conditions, but we're you know doing as much as we can um, to improve the um, substrate diversity and all of the uh, foraging areas for our fish friends. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Lisa. Just, uh, just because I am a waterfront historian counselor and you thought that maybe that was a marsh, it's all rip rock and it's all large stones. There is the original marsh that was planned by the TRCA was when Brian Denny was here and Coatsworth Cup was going to be filled in with a water cleaning marsh. That went out the window in the environmental assessment for Envi uh, Toronto, <coughs> water from Toronto, et cetera. But what's being created is a new river with some marshland along the river, but that's quite a ways away from this particular situation. So I'm happy to bring you down on your bicycle and ride you around there sometime. I would love that, Paula. Oh, boy, let's, Mr. Sachs, let's make a date. Take you with us. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Paula, did you want to speak to this item or? Uh, I see Joanne has her hand up. I don't know if it's about this one. Sorry, Joanne. Thank you, Chair. Um, You'd be disappointed if I didn't ask this question because we've experienced the algae issue in your our um, wastewater plant. So does it have tertiary treatment on this plant? It looks like pretty large plant. I don't know if anyone can answer that. So so there is um, uh, actually, you know what, I, I want to get into, there is going to be, it's, how can I say, part of the work we're doing supports major upgrades to the systems and in terms of the technology and the treatment so uh, there is you know there is that level of treatment but there's going to be an even more enhanced uh treatment that's part of the landform work that's taking place out there i don't know lisa if you wanted to add or anybody else on the team to that sure john i i, I can add through the chair um Toronto Water is building a high rate treatment facility on the landform facility. They've also um, undertaken a number of other upgrades associated with um, the treatment plant. And one of the um, things that is happening with their outfall project is all of the um, spoils um, from that tunnel digging is actually um, how we're building the landform too so it's been a, a really kind of full circle sustainable process that's happened there so there are a number of initiatives that and, and really our ea and our work focused on the shoreline protection and the erosion um, and sediment control in the area but it integrated all of these different pieces that toronto water had other approved da's for um, that were focused on water quality and treatment plant upgrades well, I appreciate the information, thank you. But, um, you know, this tertiary treatment is what removes the nutrient loadings, which feeds the algae. So I think it's very important for water quality that we start looking, I know we at TRCA can't do that, but I think working in tandem with communities that such as Toronto that have that issue. Thank you. John, it's just a small plant. It only services 750,000 homes. Just joking, it's huge. Any other questions on this item? Speakers? Paula, did you wanna to speak to this item or move the recommendations? Uh, I, I will, I'll just quickly speak and jo Joanne, I'm really interested in what you had to say because I think as, as we're protecting the shoreline and this part of this is, uh, I'm just gonna let everybody know from the original environmental assessment for the uh, Don River, there was to be a connection between the spit going across the sewage treatment plant and over onto a promontary at Ashbridges Bay, and that was killed. 
And now these groins are being built out partly, uh, John, you would know, in order to enhance the kind of public area in front of the water treatment plan. But as of when it's last year built out, now there is the algae blooms that are starting along the shoreline. So I do think that anybody who has a waterfront ward uh, knows about the waterfront. It's really something that we have to be very careful about. And I'm not sure that that's ever an anticipated consequence or something where we're building in how we're going to deal with that. So that is a problem now. I look forward to seeing how that was dealt with in the EA. I know it's a Toronto water project, but John, as you and I well know, the TRC is extremely involved in this. It's it's landfill from everywhere that are building out the uh, the beach and the groins there at, at, at Toronto Water. So um, this would be a good example of looking to the future when we're doing these things to ensure that the water quality for all lake users, very popular little beaches that are now being overrun with green algae. And I'm sure that's the case. Frenchman's Bay like that. I know, I know the eastern, far eastern area, the Rouge River mouth, the park along there, it suffers greatly from captured uh, algae. So um, that is something that we should keep our eye on for all projects. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and through the chair, the algal bloom issue is an international, uh, binational matter. Um, but some of it, some of it and, and I know you're aware of it, Chair, you're attending the International Association of Great Lakes uh, Conference that's co-sponsored by TRCA this year. Uh, that is something that, uh, you know, is dealing with some of that science, but there's, there's a lot of great uh, uh, work underway to try to address this. Uh, it, is, it is a major binational issue that we're trying to address, and a lot of it is hitting the North Shore of Lake Ontario across our jurisdiction. So, um, you know, that, that's something that if, if there's more interest in the algal issue, I'm, I'm going to speak to staff and see if there's some more information we can bring forward, even if it's just to circulate some of the, um, the best science that's coming forward on understanding and uh, addressing some of these. Uh, again, it's just a, a major, major issue that uh, uh, is impacting our, our waterfront. So thank you for raising it. Sorry, John, I've got, I was never there prior to the groins. So that is... I don't want to hear it was there before. It was always clear. Thank you very much. All right. I'm happy uh, to go to the conference and tell them that. Diana Sachs, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. I, I um, wanted to say I reported on algae to the Ontario Legislature when I was the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario a couple of times. And uh, just for everybody's information, the Increasing tertiary treatment at sewage treatment plants is about the most expensive way there is to reduce phosphorus and doesn't reduce it very much. Um, the primary sources of phosphorus now are agricultural runoff and runoff from city streets. So, uh, anyway, just for everybody's information. Uh, Shelley, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry to go back, but I, I'm just I, I heard a, a point of different information between staff and Councillor Fletcher, and I just want to give staff a chance to resolve. Is there a misunderstanding here? Because I, I, I heard an answer, but then I, I just heard that's not that's not correct. Does staff want to go back and readdress that? I, I think I think it would be fair to let them. I, I think through the chair, I think what we want to do, and what I committed to as staff directions, is to have more of a joint discussion involving Toronto Water on what is taking place. It is a it is a, it is a, the algal issue and the, some of the water quality issues in Coatsworth Cut in that area are, you know, it's a shared, it's a shared, um, um, you know, obviously we're doing the work there on the, on the shoreline, but there are other elements of the approved environmental assessment that still need to be implemented. And I know the algal bloom issue is another complicating factor. So I think, um, you know, the points that um, Councillor Sachs raised too, I mean, that's something that on a binational level, we're trying to address through all of the various forums that we're involved in as well uh, with the uh, federal uh, government and the US EPA and, and all of the states where a lot of this is actually coming from. And so it's something that, um, and, and you know, it's coming from parts of Ontario too in a big way, agricultural, especially. Especially, so we we I think we want to have a, a discussion and then also to circulate some more information on the algal issue. Uh, just 
uh, that summarizes some of the best uh, emerging information on it. So, um, I, if it's okay, we could we could uh, take that as staff direction. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in again because uh, there was no algae bloom prior to this work, and I just want to have that established. It's many different places, but there was none. Now it's establishing, and I just you can address that yes or no if you'd like or wait till you bring this back i i really just want to i would like to have the discussion with toronto water present and uh, and we can have that discussion with toronto water standalone the cobble that we're talking about here is for the beaches i mean it's related to the larger geographic area that we're talking about Coatsworth Cut, Ashbridge's Bay, but it is, I think, I think uh, you know, the discussion about water quality within the area, uh, the cobble's not going to be a factor on that and in, in installing the, the cobble or if it's going to be a very, very small factor uh, on that. So I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not impacting our ability to continue to progress the commitments and implement the permitting um, requirements on this project. Sorry, Amber, I see your hand up. Um, just for you, Mr. Chair, I think there um, is a great opportunity before us, and I think two things can be true. I look forward to more information from staff on this, and you know, very, very likely um, some of the contributing factors uh, to this, you know, this issue that's affecting many jurisdictions. Uh, may in fact be some of the construction and some of the other issues that uh, Councillor Fletcher is speaking to. And, and so I think the best option here, and I just want to echo uh, and certainly add my uh, my support uh, to the directions of staff um, to bring back some information for us to better understand this issue and um, some of the contributing factors uh, and how it's being mitigated uh, going forward uh, for all of us, especially as waterfront communities. So uh, I thank you, thank my thanks to John for taking that away. Okay, thank you, Amber. I don't see any further hands on this item. Um, I need a mover. Councillor Fletcher? Yep, thanks. Thanks, Paul. All, right. All in favor? And that carries. We are on to 8.2 2023 unfunded priorities held by Diane Sachs. Diane, questions of staff yes, on 8.2? Uh, yes, my question is about the Vale of Avoca. I don't see it on this list. Um, having looked at it this week with uh, with my constituents, uh, the, all the infrastructure in that area is failing, failing rapidly and badly. Um, I, I'm surprised not to see it on the list of projects, given uh, how catastrophic the consequences the failures continue to multiply. That's my first question, um, and then I have a second question. So, I'm sorry, uh, through the chair, through the chair, on, on that first one, could you, I, I couldn't hear that well, the, the specific name of the site. Okay, it, it's the Yellow Creek or Vale of Avoca, um, okay. just west, west of uh, Young Street, at the north part of my ward. Okay, thank Could you. Could you look into it and get back to me? Sure, yeah, you can look into that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And my second question is is a more general question. These are large risks that affect property and safety as well as the um, public and private infrastructure in these areas. Uh, we heard the provincial government and the debate over Mary Margaret McMahon's um, proposed private member bill about flooding awareness assure the public that nobody has to worry because the conservation authorities have got it all in hand. And this list of desperately needed work that we don't have the money to do, I think is just not known to the public at all. So my question is, what are you doing to draw to the attention of public Sorry, Diane, we're we're having trouble hearing you. I think a plane just flew over you, or is flying right. over you. 
You're right. I'm sorry about the airplane. Let, let me try again. I'm sort of holding the phone closer to my mouth. Perfect. Uh, my question. Is, okay. Sorry, my my fault. I forgot where I where I was connected by audio. So my my question is, we've got major risks to human life and safety, um, and to the uh, to public and private infrastructure being caused by our inability to do this essential work because of the lack of money primarily from the provincial government. Um, last week, or maybe it was this week, um, Mary Margaret McMahon proposed a private member's bill to increase flooding awareness and the response of the provincial government in voting the bill down was nobody has to worry, the Conservation Authority has it all in hand, which is what the people believe, that they don't have to worry about flooding because the CRCA has it all in hand and what this list helps drive home is that we don't have the money to do what's essential to protect life, health, and property. So my question is, what are we doing to make both the public, the, region, the municipal governments, and the um, insurance companies know, understand that this essential work is not being done? Thank you. So, so thank you so much for the question. And through the chair, there's a great deal that's going on. Uh, I wanted to... Um, uh, I guess first speak to an upcoming report that we are bringing forward to the board of directors that will talk about the state of our flood, uh, our flood systems, our flood infrastructure, flood uh, management infrastructure, which speaks in a little bit, well, it's a small book, but I know that's fine with you, Councillor Sachs. I know that you could probably read through it uh, very quickly, but it, it is a really good um, summary of our of our critical infrastructure and where there are needs and and I so I think that that's one thing that we're doing to, is to bring that forward uh, and and that's part of our work on asset management that uh, we've uh, briefed the board on previously but one of the things that uh, uh, we also do and and maybe I'll ask uh, director uh, Samir Dalla to speak to it is the education component to try to make sure that there is uh, greater awareness from the province. Um, I've also reached out to the relevant ministers and tried to involve them in this. Uh, we are uh, obviously trying to take advantage of every single potential program intake federally, provincially, working with our municipalities every day to try to find match funding to try to, um, you know, achieve the disaster mitigation adaptation funding elements. We do that in partnership with uh, with for example, the city of Toronto. So uh, maybe if that's all right, and, and on intact and, and the Insurance Bureau of Canada, working with them, there's quite a bit of work that goes on, but I know Samir could probably articulate a great deal of this uh, better than me. Uh, Samir, did you wanna speak to some of the upcoming, including the workshops and work that we're doing? Okay, I'm not seeing perhaps, perhaps, uh, Perhaps he's not in uh, on this one, but but absolutely, our team is doing a great deal of work on that front. Uh, the upcoming report on flood infrastructure will articulate quite a bit of it, and related to the unmet list, this is actually serving as an important guide for us to go out and communicate and uh, and help find, for example, you know, working with York Region, uh, if there's an issue with the Stowville Dam and the channel. This having this on our list helps us raise it and flag it to uh, our municipal partners to see if we can make up that 40%, uh, 60%, so we can get that other 40% from the federal government. Also, having this on our list um, helps us when we're going out to the uh, province related to any water um, erosion control infrastructure funding that may be available, and sometimes other municip other conservation authorities may be under under, um, I, I guess maybe they may not be in a position to implement some of these projects. So what we try to do is, is if they're, uh, if the program is, is going to have some availability, then we're ready with our projects and we can uh, go after any potential residual funds if they're underspent for the year or they haven't been able to get projects off the ground or haven't been able to get match funding. Having uh, this list helps us target that. So there's a quite an active effort on the municipal level at the provincial level, working with MNRF, at the uh, federal level, working with the uh, disaster mitigation, uh, and through the grants and fundraising team. Uh, Michael, do you want to add to that? 
Absolutely, thanks, John. Uh, what we found is we started doing this a couple of years ago, uh, putting together the holistic uh, entire listing of what our known quantum of unmet uh, needs are from both an operating and a capital standpoint. Uh, what you see before you today is about $400 million of projected costs over a 10 year period. Uh, and this has been extremely helpful. A, when we're going to municipalities, we provide them with this document. Uh, and so when there are opportunities uh, to leverage some municipal funding uh, with funding and grants, uh, we've been able to jump at those opportunities. And because it is board approved a lot of the time with funding and grants, uh, the, the granting agency is looking for uh, the board support on an individual project. Uh, so just having this document has really paid dividends. As John said, CCRF, some of the other bigger things that we've had uh, success on in recent years have been because of this document. Uh, so on an annual basis, as different uh, operational or capital needs uh, arise, uh, we add it to this list and make sure that the board's aware uh, so that uh, you can be advocates of your municipalities at the same time that we're having these discussions and at the same time when we're having uh, our quarterly meetings with board members at the municipal meetings, uh, if anything uh, is coming up from a funding and grant perspective or any other opportunities well, as well, you. then we're raising it then. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, I see Diane's hand is up again. Well, I have a follow-up question. I mean, first of all, you know, thank you for the list. I agree that the list is, is very useful and I appreciate you doing it, but I think we could do more with it. Um, uh, as I put in the chat, I would like to know if we get a formal response from the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Uh, also, I, I would suggest you consider asking them to do an update of their report. So you might remember, I think it's about three years ago, maybe four, they did a report um, in cooperation with the Federation of Can Canadian Municipalities on the financial shortfall of preparing for climate change and they estimated that Canadian municipalities at that point needed something like $5.2 billion a year to cope with climate change and prepare for what's coming. So this list of unfunded critical infrastructure that whose need is going to be excessive of a climate change would be an interesting thing for them to write an update about. So have you considered such an approach? And if not, are you willing to do so? And I guess the third part is, are you making this clear to the press? So through the chair, um, it's, uh, in terms of the press, I think what we're trying to do is just um, work with our municipal partners. A lot of this is partnership and, and we have, you know, obviously I did uh, related to the uh, initial kickoff of the bill. I was there on behalf of Conservation Ontario and NTRCA uh, when um, uh, MPP uh, Mayor Margaret Mann uh, brought that forward, the private members bill. But on, on top of it, you know, we, we regularly try to um, when we're when we're going forward with uh, submissions and everything like that with our municipalities we're it's it's one of those things that we really do work in concert with our municipalities on a lot of this to make sure like so so when we communicate out we're trying to communicate with them on projects so that's really the approach we've been taking and um you know obviously uh there's the workshops we have had risk meetings there has been some media around those specific uh, uh, specific projects or specific initiatives to communicate risk to communities of interest. So, you know, the areas south of the GRS Laura Dam, we did a whole risk uh, seminars. We've done workshops with our municipal partners uh, related to uh, parts of the Etobicoke Creek watershed that I know uh, Councillor Francesca and others are familiar with. So there's been there's been that kind of communication out there uh, associated with that. Um, what we have also done related to some of our projects where we're seeking funding, uh, we've, we've gone out there, but usually we try to do that in concert with our municipal partners. So on Rockcliffe, as you know, we're working very closely with uh, the City of Toronto uh, on that one as an example. That's our highest priority uh, uh, site. And so we've been working in concert with the city on trying to uh, publicize a need for attention to that from all levels of government. That's an example, but we we do try to do it jointly with our municipal partners for the most part. Okay, thank you, John. Are there questions on this item? 
Seeing none, speakers on this item? Can I have somebody move the uh, report? Amber, all in favor, that carries. Our next item is 8.3 update on the finance agreement for the new administrative office building project held by Shelley Carroll. Shelley, questions of staff? There, thank you. Uh, my, my menu went away there. Um, yeah, I just have questions, I'm just trying to make sense of this. Um, first of all, I'll just say I, I hate reports on in swaps because they, they don't fit neatly into charts and I have a chart brain. So um, I'm just trying to understand uh, the terms that we're, that we're being left with here. Is, is there any way to negotiate this so that we can actually hold on to a rate for longer? It looks like uh, we're, we're holding on to a rate for a year at a time, but we have not been able to negotiate anything more than that. Is that part of the original deal or is that, is that a, a, a symptom of the market right now? And so this is the best we can do. So through the chair, it's a fantastic question. It's more a symptom of when we expected the building to be completed. Uh, when we originally yeah. uh, started constructing the building, it was in a pre-COVID environment. Uh, we were expecting to get in at a certain date. Um, then there had been certain delays. And so we put it out for another year and a bit to, to be able to get to the finish line. Uh, and now we're looking to extend until June of next year. And again, we can we have the ability to finish before that. Um, we could uh, go to the bank and ask them for a longer swap period. It just ends up costing us more. So what we've explained okay. in the financial details, the, the longer tail you have on the amount of months, they have to hedge because they have to try and figure out what's going to happen to the rates in the future. So right. what, what we've done, um, I think uh, what we would have normally expected is we'd be done by the end of this year uh, because of all the delays that have happened. We're trying to be conservative and say, let's give more runway uh, until June of next year. But no, it hasn't been a symptom of uh, not being able to negotiate rates. It's just been us trying to be prudent to control the amount that the rates are increasing by. Oh, okay. So your your sense in dealing with them with with CIBC is uh, um, that they that they're they're not uh, they're not worried. They're they're giving us lots of runway to completion, and and then we'll settle into a a, a pattern of of examining the rates. Um, when we're in payback period and we're moved into a completed building. Once we're locked in and we convert into loan, this is the rate that we're going to be paying the entire time. Okay. Uh, and so really it's just that runway to figure out when we're converting. So it, like I said, in a pre-COVID environment, we already would have been in the building and we would have our fixed rate and we'd be paying it. Uh, right. But because we're not getting in uh, until probably early next year, then the rate has changed then. So hedging has still been really beneficial for the organization, uh, yeah. but it's just that the rate has changed. Okay. And that's that's the best stamping fee we can get? That is the best stamping fee that we could guess. Yeah, off the bat, uh, they told us what it was and we haven't been able to change it since the outset. Okay. Well, at least it's not climbing. So it's yes, three exactly. quarters of a percent. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Those are my only questions, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I can I can move the item unless others have questions. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Does anybody else have questions on this item? Seeing none, Shelley's moving the report. All in favor? That carries. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, number four is our investment statement of policy and procedural update. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions they consider in public, or we'll save this for the in-camera session. Amber, you held it. Did you want to wait for in camera or? Uh, I'm okay with in camera. I essentially just wanted to follow the line of inquiry that uh, Council Fletcher raised just around um, how we select who we do business with and what that criteria looks like. Um, so I defer to you for I think that should be an in camera discussion. Okay. All right. So we will hold that one down. Uh, under. Section three. Ten I, ju I just have one question that if I can ask a, a question in, in public. Sure. Go ahead, Shelley. Yeah, because it just speaks to policy. Um, 
I'm I'm just wondering again if we could we could talk about because I don't I don't know what the uh, uh, what the overarching policy is for the holdings that, that TRCA uh, has. It's never, it's never sort of come up because uh, I wasn't on executive until this term. Um, and so we don't get into this deeply in the board. Um, what's the overarching policy? Is there a legislative amount that we have to hold on to? Um, uh, or is it simply a matter of backing whatever we have outgoing in, in, in uh, um, liabilities and, and capital work? How do we decide how much we're holding on to and 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 what's the legislative uh, uh, you know lines around that? The great question. And Michael has done a ton of work to get a lot of expert advice when uh, Michael came on here, and uh, there was a lot of concerns about what we had and what we didn't. Yeah. There's been quite a bit of restructuring involving the board uh, um, on this, and and Mike, maybe you can kind of summarize some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. And, uh, again, great question. We've we've gone as an organization from having uh, a net surplus of uh, about two million dollars to about thirty million dollars uh, in my time as CFO. Uh, and really, what we've been trying to do uh, from a legislative compliance perspective, we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, we the best we've been trying to follow the best practices out there, uh, which are to try and have about six months of operating uh, revenue in case something were to happen, um, which uh, of course COVID happened and uh, really put that to the test in terms of managing our, our revenues and making sure uh, that we're managing our expenses at the same time. Uh, but really, in the world that I came from, from PwC, that was for a not for profit. That was the best practice. Uh, and then anytime we're looking to dip into what those reserves, we've come back to the board because that's, again, the best practice. And what we've been trying to do is just leverage that funding. Uh, so whether it's the CCRF and we have an opportunity to get additional money from the province or the federal government in order to do a project, but we know that municipal funding isn't there right away. Uh, then it allows us to be more agile as an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also allowed us to spend ahead in certain circumstances, and I point to the HVAC at Black Creek Pioneer Village uh, when there was a $2.3 million ask, uh, and the City of Toronto wasn't able to pay us back for a couple of years. We threw from reserves, and then we're able to get that money back uh, and put it back in. So really, that's it's not from a legislative perspective. It really just is a best practice as a not-for-profit is what we've been acting on right and that's that that's why i was asking because we're we're just we could easily say if anybody asked us if we're going looking for our unfunded projects and we're, we're in in talks with the federal government what we're investing what we're holding on to is really it's what you would expect of any operation of this size they could never turn around and say hey you got all those reserves because we're 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 really just at industry standard here and and trying to stay there in this market <laughs> <laughs> is that that would that be a correct way to put it? That is a correct way to put it. Yeah, still, if you look at other smaller not for profits, they have a larger proportion of surplus to their annual revenues. So, I mean, we do have the opportunity theoretically to continue moving up. Uh, but, like you said, when there are opportunities for funding, we're looking into leveraging so it turns into 50 cent dollars and it turns into a win win for all yeah. of our stakeholders. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just needed that overarching part. I can, I can wait for the in camera for the mix, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Uh, any other public questions on this item? Seeing none, so we'll hold that item down. Uh, next, we're in under section three items for information of the board 10.2 2022 year end financial report was held by Shelley. Shelley, questions of staff? Sorry, you're muted, Shelly. Uh, I, I actually don't have any questions now. Uh, while we were talking about the, the, the first item, I was able to review it. I hadn't been able to finish it. I'm good with this one. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody yeah. else have any questions on this item? 2022 year and financial report? Seeing none, Shelly, would you like to move it? Happily. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Being moved by Shelly. All in favor? That carries. Next we have, do, 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 Madam Clerk, I believe we're going in camera. Sorry, through the chair, that's correct. You've got um, just the motion to move into closed session for the three items. 
Perfect. So I am going to move that the executive committee move into closed session pursuant to subsection C.4.2 G of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority's Board of Directors Administrative Bylaw for item 12.1 and 12.2 and sorry, 8.4. 8 Pursuant to subsection C.4.2E, as the subject matter consists of litigation or potential litigation affecting the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. All in favor? That carries unanimously. I will give the clerk a moment to get us in camera. Great. Thank you very much uh, to members of the public. Uh, members of the Executive Committee of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority have come back into public after dealing with two items in camera, 12.1 verbal update regarding food services agreement and 12.2 verbal update regarding, why do I have that twice? The Humber Trail, Humber Bay Trail Gap. Um, so if I can, do I need a motion Madam Clerk, approving our in-camera actions? Through the chair, yes. It would just be to um, receive the verbal update regarding the first one would be the food services agreement, and then the second one would be the verbal update regarding the Humber Gap Trail. Okay. Can I have a motion to receive 12.1 verbal update regarding the food services agreement? Moved by Chris Fonseca. All in favor? That carries. And 12.2, the Humber Bay trail verbal update on the humber bay trail gap moved by amber morley all in favor that carries going back to our last public item uh, which was sorry just scrolling up 8.4 investment statement of policy and procedure update so we uh, have a two point to uh, approve the report and also there's an amendment amended recommendation Mr. Chair, I need to open 8.1 again, please. Okay, so Paulo, sorry, we're just finishing on 8.4. Yeah, just letting you know. Thank you. Uh, that updates to TRC's investment statement um, policy and procedures be approved in the staff report back to the TRCA's future on TRCA's future uh, investing and banking strategies. Can I have a mover, please? Amber Morley, all in favor? That carries. Uh, Paula, you wanted to reopen 8.1 RFT yes, supply and delivery of cobblestone dash yep. Bridges Bay land form project, beaches three and four. It might uh, be, uh, I, I don't know if this is going to be in public or not. Let's go back in camera. Okay, all in favor opening, reopening 8.1? Paula, do you have questions of staff? Uh, can I ask them in public, Mr. Chair? Well, yeah, there's no confidential yep. part to this report. Okay, so. then um, I, I am, uh, I don't know if you had any conversations with the city. There's a fair amount of, of stuff that's going to be taken out correct or brought in delivery of cobblestone coming in how many tons is it again and how many trucks would that be so it's the, yeah sorry it is uh, it is being imported and uh and one second i just want to look at the tonnage i'm trying to find the report there um one second please kind of trucks per day that kind of thing yeah uh, based on the, the tonnage per truck. So we have the RFT there. Uh, so I'm sorry. One second, please. It's page, it's yep. item point page six, seven. Can add here. Sorry. I'm okay. just trying to find it here. Yeah, yep. it's. Yep. Um, I'm trying to find the metric tonnage here. One second, Paul. I'm sorry about that. I'm just, my eyes here are failing me here right now. Um, Maybe Michael sees it. Sorry. 
sorry, I'm I'm just looking for the tonnage rates here, and I'm and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not finding the tonnage specific tonnage rate here. Um, sorry, Paul. I I'm I'm sorry, Councillor. I'm just I can't seem to find the the. Uh, I don't have a tonnage rate in here. Sorry, I thought there was one. Sorry. It's so I guess uh, what what I really want to do here is there's one thing that is, uh, in just reviewing it, it says that potential suppliers given the option to deliver material either by truck or by barge is both are reasonable options. And I'm wondering who you spoke with at the city given the gardener rebuild the a waterfront rebuild, the congestion that we're experiencing, and the Ontario line, that there wasn't, uh, and I would have to say that by BART, they are very different, and not coming by truck would be the preferred option. And I can't believe that city transportation said that they were equal. And this is a project on behalf of Toronto Water, correct? That's correct. We're working with Toronto Water on this. Yes. So, so I, I know the importing and, and, you know, there's been uh, quite a, uh, you know, quite an extensive ongoing um, uh, importing of materials for both, you know, the sewage treatment plant upgrades, the UV treatment that's going to be applied in the future. There's ongoing materials and work going on. It is a very busy part of, of Leslie. Um, it's, I mean, is there? I mean, what we've tried to do, and obviously, we we give the uh, we give the option on this, but um, it has been, for the most part, uh, there has been some work done by Barge, and and I know you've seen some of that out there because I know uh, you're you're frequently out there, uh, but there there's also the work that's going on um, by truck, and and so, you know, both options are viable options for this. I guess if you're delivering to build the sewage treatment plant, as there is another report coming to improve building number one, that there's no option to bring anything in by barge. But this is an option to bring this by barge and then locate it in that area. And in the past, uh, materials have been done by barge when it's directly related to shoreline. So. What I'd like to do, and I, I'm having trouble believing that that uh, the city, Toronto Water, would have been part of that decision, and I don't know. I'd like to defer this or send this to City Council for approval, since it's on half be, on behalf of uh, and ask for some information about that. Because sure, you don't know how many trucks we're talking well, about. Well, I know we, how many we, trucks there are for the Ontario line. A hundred a day down. I, I just, I think our part of it is very slight. I mean, and I, you know, no, I'm hearing no. that four trucks per day is something that we would anticipate related to bringing the cobble in, which is, as as you know, on Leslie Street, there's many many trucks going through the private operations and everything like that. Yes, so uh, we try to limit the number of trucks if we can, and this was an opportunity to limit that. So, so, so I, 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 I guess I guess I just want to make sure that, you know, we're and, and there are issues that we've experienced with obviously lake uh, lake issues, lake levels, winds that really impact barging that, that, that have been a factor on some of our sites and including last year when we had lower, lower than average lake levels, which then resulted in challenges and double the barging and triple the barging that it would normally take if it was one barge load, it would take three because of depths and everything like that. So there are some issues like that. So. I think we're looking at an extra 600,000 uh, plus for more barging that would uh, be involved. And so there is a cost factor as well. So right. um, I, I, I would I would um, maybe ask staff if you wanted to add anything to that, Anil. I'm still waiting to hear the number of trucks. Um, through, through you, Madam uh, Chair, uh, in terms of the number of uh, trucks, uh, Councillor, it will be approximately um, four trucks uh, per day uh, is the estimate based on the volume. Um, and just, I guess, yeah, adding to John, um, it'll, it's the, um, the barge component when we evaluated was, um, from a cost perspective, uh, approximately 600 
um, uh, thousand over, um, and those truck deliveries, that kind of the delivery period is over um, over a ten month period. So that kind of that okay. number of trucks kind of varies over the day as well. Okay, so ten month period. Uh, we do have a hub approach now at the city for construction management. I'm not sure if this was put under a construction management for large trucks, including all the cement trucks, all the Ontario line trucks, all the gardener rehabilitation, all of the work for the mouth of the dawn uh, for a truck, we're at the tipping point. So I'm really afraid that I have to have the city clear this and I don't know if they have, because at the end of the day, that's however many trucks for a day, 120, times 10,000 trucks, 1,000 extra trips that might not be necessary on those roads. Plus Toronto water roads, plus the TTC yards, plus I could just go on and on. So I don't think this was taken into account and I don't know what to do, but what I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is just, I don't know if we can just leave this and take this without, um, when is our, our meeting i just can't recall when the april, full board meeting the chair the next uh, board meeting is on april 28th and if and if that's um if that's acceptable and i i just want to uh discuss with staff if that impacts any of the fisheries timing windows or anything like that or puts us at risk on that uh but but i mean i'm i'm happy to take direction to to defer it and to get some more additional information included and bring it back to april 28th yeah. I, I just send it without without recommendation to April twenty eighth. That way we can I, look at that, please. I just want to confer I just really quickly want to ask staff. I don't want us to be at risk of missing any key windows or anything like that. And and Anil and, and anybody on um uh but but listen. Were you I planning think, to let the contract before the board approved it? No. Uh, no. absolutely. So but, we're approving I, it today. We're it's no. executive committee. It has to still purview. go to the board. Well, the, per, the executive committee has purview on certain tender oh, matters, I see. But, but, but what we would do, I listen, I understand that this is a very important matter to you, Councillor. We can defer it and bring it back. Uh, I'll try to get as much information and what I'm going to commit to you is for us to have an offline discussion uh, with you um, just to make sure that it's all understood. And I'd also like to, again, I've, I've flagged your earlier questions as well. I've reached out to Lou. De Geronimo and we'll be talking to his team. So I'd like to make sure that we incorporate some of that into an updated report. So if that's okay, uh, through the chair, we can take direction to defer it to the next meeting and bring it back with some additional information. Well, we should just refer it to the meeting then. Or re oh, wait, refer it to the That's fine, refer it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is that good, Paula? Yep, uh, and to discuss with the city and maybe they'll be at the meeting because uh, I can't take any more trucks, sorry, people. Sorry, John, just just so in the report, and I thought this was dealt with at Toronto City Council pre-COVID, was trucking versus barging, was that approved at City Council and delegated to the TRCA, or how did that, was that just a TRCA decision, we'd either do trucking or barging? It's, it's always been contemplated like we we put it in there as an option so we can get the best options available and and whether or not you know that sometimes makes sense and sometimes it doesn't for the people that are bidding on this work and uh, so we put both options out there obviously it's something that you know I've had discussions with councillor uh, councillor Fletcher on I've had count, uh, discussions with councillor McKelvey on on other matters and uh, out on the Rouge Beach and how do we get materials through and everything like that uh, with uh, you know minimal impacts and so it's something that we put both options out there uh, but but on the broader project in terms of the Ashbridges Bay um, the environmental assessments and everything that set the stage for this had always contemplated trucking we've done our very best to keep the movements and again we use the spoils within the site so uh, we've created access between the water plant where it comes out of the conveyor belt to keep most of the soil movement happening so you don't have to go out on leslie street and unwin or anything like that so that's what we've tried to do to minimize trucking but uh, uh, like i said we'll we can add some additional points uh, related to this uh, anil is there anything else that you wanted to share 
Uh, nothing at this time, John. We can definitely uh, do uh, do some additional um, information for in advance of the board on this one. Could you just ask to Mr. DiGeronimo and Mr. Chair when there was large amounts of sand being taken out of Scarborough that was to be trucked to Ashbridges Bay? It was barged to Ashbridges Bay, even though it was more expensive. So that that was uh, when we're doing beach work often. That's the case, and that was long before all of these projects had converged at the same time around congestion. So thank you very much for your support on this, colleagues. Okay, so we're moving. So we need to, so we reopen this, correct, Joanne? So it's reopened, and we're moving a motion to, to refer it to the April board meeting. Sorry, through the through the chair, um, under section 16 of the admin bylaw, because it's being it has already been discussed and voted on at this meeting, we just need two thirds of the members to open it as a reconsideration and then have the motion to defer it to the April 28th board of directors meeting. Two, three, four. Okay, but I think one, two, three, four, five. We have five members that I can see. Is that enough to do this? I believe we have seven. Let me just count again. One, two, three, four, five. I see six now. Thank you, Diane. And I believe member Fonseca as well. I think she's, that's the only um, additional one that might not be showing up on the screen. Chris, can you still hear us? I'm not seeing hearing Chris Fonseca. Chris Fonseca. Sorry, Joanna, I need Chris to successfully vote this to the April. We don't have quorum. That's correct. I just uh, sent a message to her staff to make sure that she's available. Okay. Where did Councillor Peruzza go? He can't leave. He's supposed to adjourn these meetings. There we go. Thank you, Chris. Sorry, we just, we reopened 8.1 and we are uh, referring 8. Point, sorry, I have to vote to reopen 8.1 officially, Joanne? Sorry, through the chair, we just need a motion to reconsider item 8.1. All right. Councillor Fletcher? Yep, thank you. All in favor of reconsidering 8.1? Can, can you hear me and see me? I, my, uh... Yep. My, I can uh, see you, Chris. Everything cut out. Perfect. Mm. Okay. You're back. All right. So that passes, Joanne. And then the next motion is to refer 8.1 to the April meeting, board meeting of the TRCA. All in favor of that? That carries unanimously. And then I believe, Joanne, motion to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Uh, actually, sorry through the chair. If there is any new business, I'm, I believe that the CEO needed to address something or need or wanted to bring something up. No, I just uh, I just I, um, wanted to note that you know we are bringing a number of items to the uh, April 28th meeting, which may result in um, uh, you know it may reduce the need for an executive committee meeting. 
uh, obviously we'll keep you apprised, but it may not make sense to have an executive committee meeting if we get a number of the um, uh, matters dealt with at the upcoming board of directors meeting on April 28th. So that's something, and as well, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is we're going to have a very, very busy Earth Day weekend. Um, it will be very busy, lots of events, and uh, to, to look out for something nearby. And uh, if you would like any more details, uh, we do have our events page that outlines a lot of it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a very busy time, and, and we hope you can participate. But that was uh, all I wanted to uh, say to the board and the executive committee. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, very Thank exciting. You. Earth Thank Day you, everybody. Earth Happy Day, Earth Day everybody. to everybody. Uh, motion to adjourn. Move by Amber Morley. All in favor, that carries.